so I'm rolling. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I want to first, I didn't, uh, I'm sorry, George, I did not uh, format. Uh, format this chip, and I want to be able to... Wait, you didn't ch you change chips. You left the old one in. The old one is still in, but I need to format the B chip. Okay, go ahead. Oh, wait, why does it, oh, because I'm rolling I am now rolling, am rolling. if you would do okay. the honorable clapping. Actually, one more time and do it higher and right in front of your face. Right in front of your face. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, I'd, I'd actually like to, you to start by telling us who you are, what, what mm -hmm. got you involved in forgeries, what you were doing that got you interested mm -hmm. in uh, that kind of... In, investigative work um, and then roll with that story. Beginning in the 1970s um, I was an investigative reporter, independent reporter, doing stories about art crime. Looting of archaeological sites, stolen art, museum involvement in the antiquities trade, uh, corrupt auctions, and then through some sources, I heard about a story involving the Metropolitan Museum and the acquisition of a number of fake paintings. Um, and I thought, hmm, what's going on here? This sounds interesting. My sources were people inside the museum. And um, I thought maybe this was a sour grape story, you know, one curator dissing another curator, because you get a lot of that in the museum world. And um, then I started digging more and more, and I heard about this forger, this Chinese forger called Zhang Da Chen, who was also China's foremost 20th century painter. That is, he was a very well known, very widely regarded, very high paid contemporary painter at the time. But he also had this history of doing forgeries of ancient Chinese paintings, every period of Chinese art. Tang, Sung, Yuan, Ming, the whole gamut, Qing, hundreds of them, and that they were hanging as originals in many Western collections, Japanese collections, Chinese collections. And several museum directors, uh, museum curators, scholars confirmed this for me and said, uh, but we can't talk publicly about this. It's too political. It's too difficult for us. Uh, and if you really want to do this story about the Met, you've got to look at the history and life of this forger, because he's a very unusual figure. He was alive at the time. Um, and among the people who was willing to talk to me on, who were willing to talk to me on the record, was Jim Cahill. I had heard about him. I'd met him at a symposium at the Metropolitan in the 80s, early 80s. And then I went out to see him, I believe it was 83 or 84. My daughter was a graduate student at Berkeley, so I knew about Jim, and, and he welcomed me. He was happy to see me. He was glad I was doing the story. He says this is very important. So that mm, warmed me up to him right away, because this was a field where people had a lot of secrets. And it was a relatively new field of scholarship in the West, Chinese painting studies, really a post-World War II phenomenon. And Jim was regarded as one of the top scholars in the field. We began a 30-year relationship. As I dug deeper into the story, I was writing a biography of Zhang Da Chen. I think at the time, or soon after that, I was working at Frontline doing some other documentaries. I made a, worked on a, worked, co-produced a documentary about Zhang Da Chen that Jim appears in. I wrote several articles that quote him. And I made several trips to China. Um, and I uh, found materials that most art historians don't look at. Did interviews with Zhang's students co-forgers, people who worked on these um, forgeries from the 1920s forward. I gathered a huge amount of documentary evidence that nobody else in the field had really seen or was aware of. 
Um, now, I was a journalist, not an art historian. I came into this as a journalist with a very particular interest in the forger. What I um, admired and welcomed about Jim was his openness to my approaching it this way. He didn't hide behind the mask of expertise. Once he began to see and trust that I was doing my homework, he even invited me to come speak at a sem seminar he gave on Zhang Dachen's forgeries, which was a great compliment to me. Um, I would bring him photographs of paintings he'd never seen before, uh, which he recognized immediately as forgeries of Zhang's. So we shared this, this kind of interest in history, and we would exchange information quite a bit. Uh, so my, my entry point into the field of Chinese painting studies, um, there was a steep learning curve. Uh, there were other curators and scholars that I worked with. I worked with Wu Tung at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, who had been a student of Zhang Dachen's and was now the curator of one of the most important collections of Chinese painting. He asked me to edit and help him write a catalog. So we worked together on that. Um, I got deeper and deeper into the field. Um, uh, sometimes I felt like I was uh, Margaret Mead in this very esoteric field of Chinese painting studies. It has a, a really colorful cast of characters. But what struck me about Jim always was that unlike the central casting version of a Chinese painting scholar, he, was, he had a very broad and deep focus. This was a man who read widely. He'd been an English major as an undergraduate. He was interested in jazz. He loved opera, composed librettos. And in terms of his intellectual thinking style, I, it, was, it struck me right away that he was, like, he was like a detective. He was like a sleuth. And he, it turned out, loved detective novels. He, he had read all of them, Eric Ambler, Judge D, uh, you know, uh, Goudis, uh, obscure American noir writers. He knew the whole canon of that. But his thinking was like a little bit like combination of Sherlock Holmes and Columbo when it came to sussing out authenticity in paintings. Very empirical, very grounded in common sense, very dogged absolutely unafraid of what experts and others were telling him or people who said, you know, Jim, we really should keep this under the table because they're very wealthy collectors, big museums, reputations. We shouldn't be talking about this publicly. Uh, that, I think, hit a nerve in Jim. He was an Irish renegade uh, that was in his blood. And somebody tells him, don't look here or don't speak this way, he's going to do the opposite. And he did. He spoke very courageously. Um, if something was a fake and he had the evidence to prove it, um, he wasn't afraid to speak his mind. So his methodology, if you want to call it that, was combined um, deep, true art historical scholarship on many levels, the connoisseurship of a painting, whether it's fake or genuine, its quality, but also the deep background of understanding the stylistic history of Chinese painting throughout its, the long course of its very rich development. He had that broad mind as well. Plus, he brought to it these kind of quirky detective-like skills. He could write very specifically about a particular painting or a particular painter, but also giving you the context, how a painter made his living in China, different from how it happens in the West, different paradigm. Uh, what was the patronage system like? What was the social economic context? He became increasingly interested in that as time went on. So he moved from a more formalistic study of Chinese painting, particular works of art, um, stylistic development to what in Chinese painting studies would be seen as a, you know, kind of stepping outside the um, accepted canon of thinking. He pushed the envelope. And uh, a lot of people in the field were offended by this. They didn't, they didn't like it. And they certainly didn't like the fact that he was blowing the whistle on paintings in the British Museum, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, 
the freer gallery of art where he himself was a curator. Uh, the Musée Chernuski in Paris, these were all, the Metropolitan, these were all institutions that had bought these forgeries by John. Most of them were sold in the early 50s, mid 50s. Um, you want me to continue or do you want to ask a different question? Because I'm just uh, rambling I here. See if this window's open. No, it's not open. I closed it's it. the clanging? Uh, I don't know if it's, is, you think it's possible to ask them to not bang? I don't know. They're hammering. They're where, do, do, do we know where that's happening? Uh, I can find out if you unplug me. You, Sorry about this, folks. No, it's understandable. It You're like picking it up? building a house while we're having a conversation. more helpful to me because I don't know what you're thinking. Uh, we'll start with the clap. Are you ready? Clapping again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, rolling. So um, I got into the field of Chinese painting and forgery as an investigative reporter. I had worked for Frontline and independently publishing articles about art crime, um, stolen art, looted art, museum involvement in the acquisition of stolen antiquities, and ultimately forgery. I learned um, about the problem of forgery in Chinese painting through some curators who were very disturbed that particular museums were buying in great quantity uh, forgeries by a Chinese artist named Zhang Daqian, 20th century painter, probably the foremost uh, Chinese painter of his generation, who also had a career beginning in Shanghai in the 20s as a forger of ancient Chinese scrolls on a scale unprecedented, not only in China, but anywhere in the world. He did forgeries of every period of Chinese art, Tang, Sung, Yuan, Ming, Qing, the whole gamut of this very long and rich tradition hundreds of forgeries, very difficult to detect because he worked with teams of people. He had, ac he had access to old silks, inkstones, chops, um, and multiple hands worked on these forgeries. So they're difficult to detect. And I found this story fascinating. It involved, uh, my initial focus was on the Metropolitan Museum, which had been acquiring a number of these paintings. And as I got deeper into it, I discovered that very few people in the, in the field of Chinese painting wanted to talk openly about this. It was an open secret, everybody knew, but people would only speak to me off the record until I got to Jim Cahill. Um, and um, should we take a break here? And no, start. Uh, okay, start, start with Jim. Um, let me just say a few more words about my involvement in this. Uh, I realized, uh, because I was not an art historian, I really had to do a lot of homework here. And uh, luckily, I had some mentors in the field. One of them was uh, the head of the As Asian Art Department at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, who had been a student or had known about Zhang Dachen in Taiwan. He gave me a lot of information. I worked with him on editing some catalogs of their collection, got to know the field, the scholarship, um, and then I was told if you really want to understand the character of this forger, you should go meet Jim Cahill. I went to a symposium on Chinese painting at the Met, probably 83, 84, met Jim. We set up a time to meet in Berkeley, where my daughter was going to graduate school in art history, so I came out. Uh, we had lunch at a cafe near campus. And unlike everyone else in the field that I had talked to about the forgery story, Jim greeted this with open arms. He was happy that someone from outside the field was going to look at this problem because he had lived it, studied it. Um, Jim, as I discovered, had blown the whistle on a lot of the initial forgeries that were bought by the British Museum. Musée Chernuski in Paris, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, his own museum, because he had been a curator at the Freer Gallery. Um, so he was in the thick of it, and he um, 
Uh, one of the things I'll say about Jim's character is that I think we hit it off so well. He's, a, he's an Irish renegade. He has that in his blood. He also had um, a love of detective novels, um, which means he read Judge D stories, uh, Chandler, Sherlock Holmes, and some of the methodology of the detectives he really liked, I think, rubbed off on this kind of empirical deductive method that he used to detect forgeries. He would focus on a work of art. He'd look at not only the materials that were used in the forgery, and the style, and the period, and he had enough depth in the knowledge of stylistic development in Chinese painting to see if there were anomalies in the painting to get that. But he'd also look at the provenance of the painting. Where did this come from? You know, what? They've got this 10th century painting that nobody knew about that suddenly appears in the 20th century out of nowhere, and it comes from the collection of the greatest forger who's ever lived, and you're going to tell me, wait a minute, let's think about this here. Let me see. Let me dig a, a little deeper. He had that kind of bulldog tenacity. He was not, never cowed by the legion of self-appointed experts in this field and cultural authorities. Chinese painting is a field that is relatively new in the West. It's really a post-World War II field of scholarship. There wasn't a lot of real study of Chinese painting, maybe in France, maybe in, in Great Britain, certainly not in the United States. It really begins after World War II because a lot of the scholars had worked for the OSS in China, had been over there. They got the bug. They became enthusiastic about it. Museums were starting to build bigger collections. The Met really didn't get into the game until after World War II. A lot of money was being poured into Chinese painting. Um, and so Jim was in the thick of all of that. And I think that he was never cowed by the authorities, either in China or here. Um, the reputation of museums, the reputation of collectors, that was a matter of indifference to him. What mattered was the truth. Is this a fake painting? Is it a genuine painting? Is it a painting with great quality, even if it's a fake? Or a copy, later copy? What is it exactly? Where did it come from? How did this painter work? Jim was able to ask those questions in a field where people are very siloed very, uh, they're specialists of specialties. This is a rather esoteric field. You ask, you know, people who are relatively knowledgeable about the, wa the art world to name a single Chinese painter, and you won't get an answer. But this is a tradition that's older than ours. It's a great, deep, rich history of uh, art and in, in all formats, all media. And, um, that's had a huge influence, world influence. Uh, at the same time, it's a tradition that's been very self-contained within China, except for a couple periods, Tang Dynasty and modern 19th and 20th century. China's art, fine art traditions were very self-contained and enclosed. Um, when you deal with the problem of forgery in Chinese painting, it's a little different from how it is in the West. Their cultural attitudes that are quite different. The Chinese traditionally have not had the moral opprobrium about forgery that we have. Their attitude is more, uh, all of the great work has been done in the past. We need to revere in a Confucian manner the great masters of Chinese painting. You do that by painting in their style, reinventing their style, copying them. And there is not, most of the great Chinese painters were also forgers, copyists. The imperial collections, often the emperors, had their court painters copy their collections because they were afraid the barbarians from the north were going to come down and burn the palace and steal all their paintings. So they made copies. And um, to revere the past, to show that you had mastered the past, what better way to do it than to come up with a painting that has all, can fool the top experts. So it was kind of a high aesthetic game forgery in China. Even by Chinese standards, what Zhang Da Chen accomplished as a forger is unparalleled. Um, as I say, there are hundreds of these. It's a very thorny political problem. And Jim Cahill 
more than any scholar in the West, was the one who did the most work on Zhang Dachen. He would have seminars uh, for his students on the forgeries. What a beautiful laboratory to work in, to have this forger, you know, uh, is that really a 17th century painting? How, what do you, why do you think that? You know, and you get into it. I, he, um, our relationship developed over the years, and at one point he asked me to come and speak to his seminar. Because I had been to China several times by then. I had collected materials, gotten photographs, interviewed Zhang's students who had worked on the forgeries. I had extensive documentary evidence. I had correspondence that Zhang wrote about that, you know, talked about his collecting habits. Um, I knew where some of the bodies were buried. Um, that knowledge he welcomed. We exchanged information over the years. And uh, he encouraged me to um, embark on a long project of writing Zhang's biography. And I wrote several articles about Zhang that appeared in the New Yorker Art and Antiques magazine orientations. So um, worked on a film um, about Zhang Dachen that Jim appears in. So we developed a collaboration, I would say, that, that grew over the years. I interviewed him. I have dozens of hours of interviews with him. So I got to know how he thought um, as a, as a um, I really think of Jim among scholars. He's, a, he's an American master in a certain way. He, he um, really came to this field with a much broader uh, field of understanding than I think a lot of others in the field had. I mean, it's a very specialized field, very esoteric. And um, Jim brought to it a knowledge of literature, history, culture, understanding of Japanese painting. He was not just confined to Chinese painting. He was not confined just to one period of Chinese painting. Uh, he was interested in bronzes, in erotic art, all kinds of things that scholars in the painting field don't tend to get into because uh, of his enthusiasm for it. And uh, his passion for this um, was boundless. Up until the day he died, he was working on um, this wonderful series of lectures that he did. Um, if you read his books, you'll see that they cover the whole spectrum of uh, scholarship, particular studies of a particular painting, specific artist, a period style, um, a forgery, um, a broad dynasty of painters, and the, the spectrum of, painter, of painting that goes in that. Um, he covered the map, and the depth of that knowledge uh, was extraordinary. I think of Jim as kind of a Pacific man, Pacific in the sense of his orientation was not so much Europe and East Coast. It was West Coast, California. It was the Orient. But uh, of course, you know, there's scholars in the East Coast who are interested in the Orient. But when I say that, I think Jim had a, encompassed in his mind a broad openness that's the Pacific, that's looking west and towards Asia, uh, not towards Europe. So he, he had a different sensibility. Um, and he brought to it some very American qualities and some very Irish qualities. As I said, he's a renegade. He's interested in detective novels. He loves Gilbert and Sullivan. He, he writes librettos. He's, uh, he's a performer. And um, the other quality that I think makes him a master and sets him apart from others in the field is the quality of his writing. Very lucid, very accessible, uh, not full of a lot of theoretical jargon. Uh, he writes with the clarity of someone like William James um, and elegance and, and yet, you know, really uh, grounded in, in fundamentals, fundamentals of art history, questions of quality, style, authenticity. Uh, but able to write about them without talking down to you. Um, he's talking to you, not at you. And you, you felt that, that sense of accessibility and generosity 
as a man is also in his work. And I admire him enormously for that. He stands out in this field. Let's um, pause and make sure I'm rolling. I got a few other little tidbits. Do you know about the fact that Jim was uh, sent to jail after his high school graduation? Do you know that right, story? No, we won't. Oh, no, no, no. That's fact, good. Irish yeah, renegade. Tell me when. Are we rolling? Yep. Jim was an Irish renegade. Let me give you a couple examples of that. You know, he graduated high school, and the day after he graduated high school, he was jailed because uh, he'd put up a banner attacking the assistant principal of the high school, whom everybody disliked. Uh, similar things at, at Cal um, when, he, when he was at school here. Um, Jim was a man who uh, came up through the ranks of academia during the McCarthy period. One of his teachers at Cal was a man who had been essentially blacklisted because of his supposed left-wing sympathies. Jim had a strong sense of social justice and um, was appalled by the state of American politics. I spoke to him, we spoke increasingly about this towards the end of his life. Uh, his uh, discouragement with what was going on politically uh, at the time. And I, I think about at the height of his career um, when Jim gave the Norton lectures at Harvard, very distinguished series of lectures, Igor Stravinsky, T.S. Eliot, you know, those are some of the luminaries who've, who've given those. He was offered a job in the art history department. Wow, Harvard University, woo, a lot of salary, a lot of money. But he was not a, uh, an East Coast man. He was a West Coast man. He was a California Pacific man. And he had that sensibility and sense of individualism that ran in his blood. And I think, um, and that's why he turned it down. So he came out here. Uh, there was an opening at Stanford. And he found out subsequently um, there were some things he didn't like about Stanford. Then there was a position at, at Cal. And he went for it um, and got it. And um, so you, you have him situated here on the West Coast. Um, he had already spent time in, North Korea, in, in Korea during the war, uh, Japan, spent a lot of time in China. But it wasn't the same kind of experience that I think other scholars had had who'd gone there. A lot of the uh, luminaries in the Chinese painting field had been there during World War II. Uh, they'd worked for the OSS, um, and that's how the, the, they got the bug for collecting Chinese painting and helping museums build their collections here. But Jim was there during wartime in the Korean War, and um, he was ferreting out the market in a different way from those scholars. He would go to old curio shops and antique stores, and he would get to know people who uh, may be sometimes a little disreputable, but who knew where there were interesting collections of, uh, say, uh, erotic art or collections of uh, other kinds of paintings that most scholars weren't interested in looking at. And as Jim got deeper into the field and became more aware of the problems of forgery and copying, he would go to the mounters' stores and talk to the mounters who had mounted some of these forgeries. And he found out how Zhang Da Chen, for instance, got the materials, the silks, the ink stones. So he was really looking at Chinese painting in a, in a much deeper level um, in terms of being willing to look at how artists made their living, uh, who were their patrons, uh, who mounted their paintings, where did they get their materials from. He had that kind of street knowledge of um, how painting works. I mean, you know, art history can be such a uh, sometimes effete and tony kind of world. You know, there's a lot of highfalutin writing, highfalutin talk, obscure theorizing that goes on in the field that's really kind of a private club. And um, people used to talk about, particularly in the Chinese art market in New York, 
the Chinese painting mafia, um, jokingly. But mm, at another level, there were some shenanigans that I certainly became aware of in terms of rigged auctions and you know people doing very nefarious things in the art market. Jim, you could talk to about this. You couldn't talk to other scholars about it because they were either involved, there was conflict of interest, they were worried about the reputa their own reputation, the reputations of collectors they were buying for, appraising paintings for. There's a lot of conflict of interest in this field that intensified in the 60s, 70s, and 80s as American museums started pouring money into the field. Metropolitan Museum had a roster of oligarchs putting money into the, their Chinese painting department. See Douglas Dillon, former treasurer, treasury secretary under Kennedy, the Sacklers, uh, the Elliott family. These were very wealthy, prominent families who were willing to invest in a new field about which they had very little knowledge. So they had to rely on scholars, opinions, experts' opinions, to wade through, well, why is this painting so great? Uh, I can't even pronounce the name of the painter. You know, that kind of interaction was going on. And um, I think there was enormous pressure on scholars at that time to buy as much as you can. Don't worry so much about what it is now. Just buy it. Get the gift to the museum. So these collectors uh, bought um, with expertise in the field, outside the field, got big tax write-offs for these paintings that they don donated to the museums. There, the field was rife with conflict of interest. And um, you could, off the record, get recognition of that from these scholars. On the record, they never talk about it. Too dangerous, too political. Jim was the only person, maybe one of two people that I spoke with, um, who had the courage and the commitment to finding out the truth, um, who would talk about these aspects of the scholarship and the field. And I salute him for that. I have great admiration. Uh, for him about that. Uh, I, don't, I can't think, um, you know, there were a couple scholars in Europe that I talked to who were aware of this and spoke on the record, a couple um, uh, scholars in the mainland that were willing, uh, I mean, there the political stakes are even higher um, because it's a much more controlled environment and you have the burden of the tradition itself. Uh, to give you an example, 1962-63, Jim is charged with helping to shepherd the first exhibition of the National Palace Museum collection, Taiwan, of early Chinese painting. This is a major, major exhibit, huge exhibit, and these paintings, which had been ferreted out of China after 1949 to Taiwan, um, a lot of them hadn't even been photographed. Jim was involved in getting them photographed. So we now had some evidence of these paintings to look at. Exhibition happens. There's a lot of trouble with the Chinese, the Taiwanese, because Jim didn't like a lot of the attributions of the paintings. He said, this is not a Sung painting. This is a later copy. We got to say that. There was a lot of trouble around that exhibit as to how paintings were labeled. Subsequently, all of the American scholars got together after that exhibit left. And there was this very famous symposium in New York, uh, which came to be known uh, as the Postmortem Symposium on the Fragmentation of Chinese Painting Studies, blah, blah, blah. None of the scholars, with the exception of one painting, one early painting, the scholars could not agree on the attribution of any of them. Now think about that. Here's this major collection of early Chinese painting. None of the American European scholars in a symposium, there was only one painting they could all agree on. Only one from that entire collection. Such was the diversity of opinion about forgery, attribution, all of that. This is in the early 60s. A lot of collectors shied away from getting involved 
because, hey, you guys can't make up your minds. Is this genuine or is this fake? What is it? Well, it's a complicated problem. It was a very complicated problem to sort out. And you don't have a lot of private collections coming to the West. Two major collectors after 1949 brought their collections here. One was Zhang Dachen, the forger, C.C. C. Wong, who became an advisor to Sotheby's and the Met, close friend of Jim's. I traveled to China with him myself. C.C. C. himself, even though everyone admired him and thought he was the expert, the Chinese resident expert in exile on Chinese painting in New York, C.C. was the subject of the only trial in the history of the American judiciary where two dealers sued each other over the attribution of some paintings they had exchanged. C.C. was the defendant. Walter Hochstadter was the plaintiff in the case. He was suing C.C. because he claimed C.C. had sold him a fake. Long trial, judge couldn't keep any of the names straight, kept making Chinese laundry jokes in the transcript of the trial. Eventually, he ruled in favor of C.C. And, but C.C.'s reputation, um, you know, and to many, he's like a god. You know, he was the cultural authority, wrote the book on seals, on, you know, he, he had a certain traditional Chinese um, understanding of Chinese painting. But he was also someone who was working in the art market, advisor to Sotheby's, advisor to Christie's, advisor to the Met. And, you know, you kind of wonder sometimes, is this guy for real or is he another Bernard Berenson? or Duveen, you know, pawning off paintings that he knew were dubious. You never really knew. And he was a sly fox, very knowledgeable man, very talented artist, um, uh, a wonderful personality, very close to Jim. But Jim knew, Jim knew that CC had paintings in his collection. Where did they come from? Some of them came from Zhang Da Chen, the forger. One of them, the most famous, is the riverbank, a painting that appears on the front pages of the New York Times, a first in the history of the New York Times. You have a front page story about a Chinese painting. Met acquires Mona Lisa of Chinese painting. Whoa, 10th century painting attributed, they're, they're saying it's by Dung Yuan, a painting by someone of whom there are no original existing works, only later copies, and suddenly in the middle of the 20th century, we get a new painting that nobody's ever heard of before. This is a little odd. I say nobody ever heard of. There were a few people who knew of this painting, and one of them was Jim Cahill. And if you look at Jim Cahill's index of early Chinese painting, you will see that the entry for the riverbank, long before the Met had acquired it, it says, old painting, 20th century fabrication, question mark. Jim, in his seminar, would use that painting as an example, often. When the Sackler Museum did an exhibit of Zhang Da Chen's legitimate paintings, the subject of the riverbank came up. Jim gave a lecture there. I was in the room. And he talked about his long history of unmasking and uh, playing Sherlock Holmes to Zhang Da Chen's Moriarty in uh, tracking down these, and unmasking these forgeries. And he'd talk about how John would leave these little breadcrumb clues along the way. And John was a master at this. He would create documentation for paintings. In other words, say he was doing a forgery of a 17th century painter. He'd create a correspondence between that painter and another painter where they exchanged paintings. Then he would do the forgeries. He would do the paintings. So you have the literary documentation then you have the painting itself, and people, you know, oh, yes, we know about that painting. Oh, there it is, in a, a little pawn shop in Shanghai. You know, oh, great painting. We finally rediscovered another great masterwork. The provenance of the riverbank is so full of holes and so questionable, and it fits perfectly. If you know how Zhang operated and how he created the paperwork, the paper trail, before we even get to the painting. This is, I mean, this is out of his copybook. And um, I was able 
to find, uh, for instance, correspondence between Zhang and his son about Zhang's own personal collection of Chinese paintings, where he talks about other paintings he claims were by Dong Yuan. In this letter, which was written several years after he supposedly acquired the riverbank, he never mentions the riverbank. He talks about another Dong Yuan painting, which is actually not a Dong Yuan painting, that's in the Palace Museum collection. He says, this is the crown jewel of my collection. He's writing this to his son. This is a private correspondence. Doesn't mention the riverbank. That's kind of odd. The Mona Lisa of Chinese painting? Well, okay, the Mets engaged in a little bit of hype here. Um, you know, as I say, if you ask intelligible museum goers in America to name a single Chinese artist, you're going to be hard pressed to find someone who's going to name one. Dong Yuan is not a household word like Leonardo da Vinci, but the Mets claiming that this artist is of that stature. It's a 10th century painting. But it doesn't stop with the story of the provenance. It's also Jim, as he got deeper and deeper into this controversy, started looking at the physical evidence of the painting, um, started looking at the stylistic issues in the painting, started looking at its incoherence as a composition. That absolutely makes no sense in the context of other paintings of that time, of that dynasty. Um, and he was not alone in thinking this. Sherman Lee, head of the Cleveland Art Museum, dismissed the painting in even more contemptuous terms than Jim did. Uh, pr two prominent Japanese scholars. Uh, a number, I think there were maybe six at the time of the Metz Symposium on this painting. To go back to the New York Times story, you know, here the Times is announcing this major acquisition and doesn't mention that, to my mind, the most prominent scholar in the field thinks it's a forgery by Zhang Dachen and has said so at a symposium on that painter's work previous, several years previous, at the Sackler Museum in Washington. That's a little odd. Um, they also don't mention that the Met's um, primary scholar and curator, Wen Feng, that it's his brother-in-law that's donating the painting through a private foundation to the Met for a handsome tax write-off. Now, of course, Sulzberger is on the board of trustees. Sulzberger, owner of the New York Times, is on the board of trustees at the Met. And they've had a kind of cozy relationship through the years. So I thought, mm, this is an interesting story. I'm going to try and write something about this. So I got the New Yorker to publish a little um, talk of the town piece, which was proved, I thought it was pretty innocuous. I was merely st stating the obvious. Wait a minute, boys. Uh, you know, here's Jim Cahill, Sherman Lee, a bunch of scholars who question whether this is a 10th century painting. And indeed, they think it's Zhang Da Chen. Uh, maybe we should talk about that too. Ooh, a lot of, um, a lot of um, nasty weather had to be, um, had to go, we had to endure at that time. But the, the article was translated in the Taiwanese press, the New York Chinese press. The museum was very embarrassed. And then they, that, later that summer, had this symposium on the painting where they brought a lot of scholars together. Um, most of them former students of Wen Fong at the Met. Um, so it was kind of stacked. Uh, Jim made his case, Sherman Lee, a Japanese scholar. Um, and, you know, there the matter rests. Uh, it takes time for people to absorb all of this. But none of the objections, I think he, Jim's paper was called a 13-count uh, indictment or something like that of the painting. Uh, none of the objections that he addressed in his paper, uh, or raised in his paper, were addressed at that symposium. And Jim was tireless. Uh, he went on to do further studies of the painting. And lo and behold, another version of the painting shows up, almost exactly the same, that you will have a photograph of. And Jim says, hmm, 
This fits the picture because Zhang was all, always doing multiple copies of these forgeries so that it would further confuse the field. So we have multiple images of the river of the river bank all of a sudden. And then he starts noticing that there's some very unusual tears in the fabric of the silk. And there, it's, it's a hanging scroll. You would expect there would be areas of the silk that would be worn horizontally, but vertically you don't fold a hanging scroll like that. And then he started comparing that to other forgeries in of early Chinese paintings by Zhang in the British Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts, the same pattern appears. Now why is that significant? It's one detail, but it's important because the mounter who mounted all of those forgeries was the same. Zhang and he were very skilled at artificially aging the silk, whether it was pouring tea on the silk to make it look older, or actually using old silk and fraying it in a certain way. I have never heard anyone from the Met answer any of these issues around this painting, which I find, you know, let's just have a discussion about it. Let's talk about it. Isn't this important? You've acquired this masterpiece. Is it really a masterpiece? Is it really, are you really gonna stand by the Mona Lisa of Chinese painting? I'd like to see what the Met has to say about that now. Excuse me. Can we take a break? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me when. So this little New Yorker talk of the town piece that I wrote um, raised some hackles. Uh, Richard Barnhart, a Yale University art historian, student of Wenfang, um, was outraged um, and wrote a piece um, in Orientations magazine uh, published in Hong Kong called The Spurious Controversy of the Riverbank, in which he attacked my article, which is perfectly fine. We're, we're, we're allowed to air these differences. Unfortunately, in the article, he made several misrepresentations, uh, the most egregious of which concerned Jim Cahill. He claimed that when Jim um, spoke at the Sackler Symposium on Zhang Da Chen, um, that he was booed off the stage. Um, I was there, and Jim was not booed off the stage. He gave a very entertaining account of his long uh, detective Sherlock Holmes quest after the Moriarty of Chinese painting, Zhang Da Chen. What I did notice was that Richard Barnhart was visibly angry about the fact that Jim had challenged the authenticity of the riverbank. Now, why is that? Because um, Jim had published several scholarly articles um, discussing the riverbank, accepting its attribution, um, and much of his reputation was staked on um, the authenticity of paintings in the C.C. C. Wong collection. There was a catalog that came out of the Met, Plum Blossom Spring, I believe, that uh, Barnhart worked on that uh, was uh, controversial, to say the least, because of his attributions there. But these kinds of disagreements exist all the time. There's no reason. I, I, I certainly respect Barnhart's, the integrity of his opinion. I don't respect his ad hominem attacks on Cahill me, I'll take it because I'm a journalist and he's an art historian and he wants to play that game. He wants to play, I'm the expert, you're an idiot. Okay, go for it. I don't believe you, Anita, but uh, you're welcome to have your opinion. And, uh, you know, it's the way the field operates. He took it very personally. He made it uh, an issue of, uh, I don't know, uh, it, it's how dare you challenge my authority in this field. Well. You know, is, is, I thought scholarship is about truth and asking questions and being skeptical and learning and airing different opinions. Apparently, Barnhart doesn't believe that. Uh, Jim and Barnhart have had, a, I think, an amicable, although sometimes contentious, relationship over the years. There's a published correspondence between them. Um, and uh, they've disagreed many times about paintings, which is good. It's good for the field to have these discussions. I don't think it's good for it 
when it gets personal like this. And it did get personal. It got personal around Jim because he's very outspoken. And um, he has firepower to back up his opinions. I don't accept everything Jim says lock, stock, and barrel. Nobody should. But treat the man with his due respect. And that didn't happen in the case of the Riverbank. Uh, his arguments were not addressed. The Met closed ranks. They did a lot of PR to uh, support this acquisition. Um, you know, C.C. Wong and Jim have had a long, complex relationship that goes back decades. And, um, you know, there's a certain... Um, I understand that when there's a lot of money at stake, as there was here, and a lot of reputations at stake in museums, art history suddenly starts to take on a different aura. And uh, I think we need to be open and honest about this. Um, I've spent a lot of time reporting on it. I've reported on other controversies in forgery involving the Met, rigged auctions, etc. This stuff goes on all the time. It's just not widely known. What I admire about Jim is that he was not afraid to discuss these things. Can you talk about uh, his relationship with Chen Bei Shen? <laughs> Um, After the plane goes by. Yeah. But with our luck, it's a, it's demonstration. <laughs> it's a demonstration with a helicopter that's going to sit over the <laughs> house for the next six hours. <laughs> We're the tree trimmers. Actually, while we're there, let's, let's pause. Uh, or, uh, we've got um, Barnhart is done. We Rolling. skip your... No, you had a question oh, for I, me about... I, I just, and this can happen anytime. Just in the Zhang's time. relationship with Jim, oh, the, the Jim and Zhang. Yes. Ready? Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the more interesting things about Jim is his relationship to the forger. Zhang De Jim. They knew each other. They knew each other in Japan. As I said, Jim had done work over there. He'd met Zhang's mounter. I think they stayed at an inn together, he and Zhang. But the most interesting story for me um, is that Zhang's daughter became a graduate student in art history at, at Cal and attended the seminar that Jim gave on Zhang Da Chen's forgery. So they had a little agreement that he would not refer to her father's name or identify her as the daughter of the forger, but would refer to Zhang as a prominent oriental gentleman. So there's a seminar going on in which Jim is, you know, putting paintings before his students and saying, well, tell me, what do you think about the dating of this painting. What do you think about the authenticity? And of course, these are all paintings that Jim had suspected were Zhang Da Chen's forgeries. Over the years, he had collected um, a considerable archive of photographs of these paintings that he believed were forgeries. When Xing, uh, Xin graduated, this is Zhang Da Chen's daughter, he presented her with an album of these photographs and said, would you do me a favor? Would you take this to your father and have him check the paintings that he did? Now, this is like asking Houdini or Ricky Jay, tell me how you do your tricks. Uh, you can predict the outcome. Shane went back to her father and said, my professor, whom you know, who is your friend, Jim Cahill, asked me to give this to you. And would you check off the paintings that you, in fact, fabricated? John threw it, shook his head, and he said, you tell my dear friend, Professor Cahill, that he still has a lot to learn about Chinese painting. I think that's a wonderful story. Uh, it's been repeated um, about other collectors um, in the field. Uh, Sackler, for instance, offered Zhang Da Chen a sizable amount of money if he would leave a list of his forgeries in a vault at Columbia University. Zhang shook his head and said, no, a magician doesn't give away his, his secrets. 
Zhang made no secret of the fact that he was a forger. There are several biographies um, of him that have come out in, in Taiwan and the mainland. And he tells one journalist, Taiwanese journalist, he said, you journalists are all con men. I'm a con man too. I'm a con man with my brush. Um, I found newspaper articles from the 30s uh, in China that talk about allegations that he made forgeries. Um, it's an open secret in the field. Everybody knows this. The extent, scope, depth of it, this is going to be an ongoing problem in the field for years. It has not been fully sorted out. We need to thank Jim in, as part of his legacy that at least he had the courage to take the problem on. Um, and as I said, he played Sherlock to Zhang Dachen's Moriarty. Um, and uh, they had a, a friendly adversarial relationship over the years, I would say. Um, they, were, they were respectful adversaries of one another. Um, we need to understand, too, that, uh, you know, Jim appreciated Zhang's original artwork. Uh, understand that Zhang Dachen today is, commands the highest prices of any painter in the world on the art market. If you look at Sotheby's index, you will find that to be so. He was a very prolific artist of paintings in his own right. The forgery was, um, I don't want to call it a sideline business because that it really um, cheapens it in a certain way. It was Zhang's apprenticeship into the field, copying these old masters, making these forgeries, and having a wonderful time doing it. It's how he made his mark in Shanghai in the 20s, when he was a no nobody. Uh, he did forgeries that he sold to Chinese collectors, to Japanese collectors. But his stature as an artist in the Chinese art world is analogous to Picasso's in the West. He's been called the Picasso of Chinese painting, a misnomer because he doesn't paint at all like Picasso. But in terms of the technique, the um, uh, prolific volume of his work, um, quality varies, but uh, he's, he's a stupendous, monumental, phenomenal figure in the history of 20th century Chinese painting. So you have to look at him in that way. And, and he posed a huge problem for uh, Western scholars. He shows up in Paris in the 1950s with the largest private collection to leave the mainland, one of the last. Those paintings included very important early Chinese paintings that were genuine and a lot of fakes. A lot of American museums bought them. Some shied away from perfectly legitimate works that ended up going back to the mainland um, because they were too scared of him. They knew who he was. Uh, and they knew he had good stuff, and they knew he had stuff that was questionable. You couldn't avoid him. Uh, you go back and look at the newspaper accounts of his emergence in Paris in the 50s. Major Taiwanese nationalist Chinese officials were behind promote his promotion. And he's all over the newspapers in France. He fit the image with his long Chinese sung robes, his long beard, his cane, four wives, 16 children, Japanese cooks. I mean, the whole gamut of stuff. He fit the West's image of old China perfectly. He was, as a friend of mine said, a forgery in the fourth dimension, a walking, living forgery of old China. He embodied the West's ideal of chinoiserie, writ large. And um, he's a character. He's, a, he's, he's like a rock star of Chinese painting. But he's, you know, he, he, again, he's this old China. Zhang lived in... Brazil for a while. He lived in Carmel, California. Um, he eventually went back to Taiwan. He was a political pawn between the two Chinas. The mainland was always trying to get him to go back. He had relatives there. They tried to embarrass him, blackmail him to go back, but he was 
His main backers were the nationalist Chinese, uh, top levels of the government, Chiang Kai-shek on down. He was um, an important cultural ambassador to them. When uh, the Civil War ended and, you know, when the nationalists were defeated in 1949, John was allowed to have a private plane to fly out with members of his family and most of his collection. That's how important he was to them. Um, uh, I think that, you know, Jim, uh, Jim was very interested in Zhang as a painter, as a forger. I think probably more interested in him as a forger than as a painter, but he wrote introductions to a couple of Zhang's catalogs of his own work um, and knew him. Um, so uh, it's an interesting um, doppelganger, the, the two characters, these two figures and how they interacted with each other. Important part of the story. Would there have been a, a connection to the relationship for, for Jim's invitation to go to the uh, Taiwan Museum to begin with? Um, I, you mean his relationship with Zhang Chen was that part of it? No, I think Jim was invited because he by then was a prominent enough scholar in the field. Didn't really have to do with Zhang Dachen. Um, it, it, uh, he traveled in those circles. He was known. His publications were respected. He was, had been at the Freer. I mean, he had a history by the time that collection came to the West. When you talked about that, you, you used the date 62, 63. I, b I believe that that's the date for the symposium that happened after the exhibition. I can check that. If you want to stop camera, I can get that date accurately for you. Um, well, um... <coughs> Do you want me to do your question too? Yeah. The China. China, then we'll go to the personality, then we'll go to subsequent. Okay, yeah. tell me when. Uh, after the 
these kids scream. Mm -mm. That may be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Jim's reputation was not confined to the West. He was very respected and widely regarded in both Taiwan and the mainland, uh, and in Japan as an eminent um, scholar. His books have been translated. Uh, many of his books have been translated. He's given talks at symposia. But more importantly, uh, this is a, another uh, signature part of his legacy. Um, in, I think it was in the early 70s, Jim and uh, Sherman Lee and uh, I think a few other scholars were allowed, this is one of the first times uh, post, um, you know, in the post Mao or in the Maoist period, post 49, that um, American scholars were given access to photograph painting collections in Chinese museums and visit archaeological sites and photograph them. This was a huge uh, honor and uh, very important. They, they took photographs of things that had never been seen in the West. Um, and similarly, earlier, before that, in the 50s, he had been given access to the Palace Museum Collection, National Palace Museum Collection in Taipei, which Chiang Kai-shek had ferreted out at the end of uh, the Civil War. Um, so he's very widely regarded in both Chinas. Uh, students from the mainland and Taiwan came here to study Western art historical methodology with Jim and Chinese painting. I mean, that's kind of interesting. Uh, China sending students to come here to study with Americans about their own artistic tradition. That's a, a sign of Jim's prominence in the field. Um, in China and the level of respect given to him. Um, Can we describe the man, the personality, the character? Beyond the intellect, um, Jim, the first words that come to mind to me are, are his generosity, his humor, his affability. Um, I got to know Jim pretty well. Uh, I lived Actually, when he and uh, Shing uh, moved to Hawaii and then to um, Vancouver, I rented his house on Josephine Street. And uh, my wife and I lived there for about eight years or so. And Jim would, um, the, the deal that we made was that Jim would be able to come back and use his library and stay there on occasion when he had to give lectures. So we got to know him and had meals with him. and. Um, Jim was, uh, my wife was a flamenco singer and a, and a painter herself, and he was very interested, even though she was, had nothing to do with Chinese painting, she's Mexican, and um, they had a, a, a marvelous relationship because they both had really sharp senses of humor. And I remember that about Jim, is that is, uh, you know, he really was uh, quick-witted and, uh, and fun to be around. I mean, he was not at all stuffy. It's this, again, this kind of salt-of-the-earth Irish renegade background. Uh, and he liked rebels. Uh, Patricia was a rebel. I'm a little bit of a rebel uh, myself. And so, you know, we had this kind of um, sense of each other as outsiders, in a way. Um, and uh, he appreciated that, um, and I liked that about him. And I could talk to him about not just about Chinese painting. I mean, certainly that was the core of our intellectual exchange, if you will. But beyond that, he and I exchanged mystery novels. We were both fans of spy and mystery novels. Um, and he's a movie, he was a movie buff, early movie buff. Um, and a classical music uh, and jazz fan. So we had a, a lot of rich conversations about things that weren't academic, uh, that were just fun. And, and I like that about him, um, that kind of openness. He was not um, stuffy, rigid, kind of, um, or, or intellectually patronizing. Um, and uh, even though he lived most of his life in academia, there was never that kind of talking down at you. Uh, and understand, I came into this world of Chinese painting really from uh, an odd, eccentric angle. I was looking at, um, you know, ethics, ethical issues in the museum world, ethical issues in the art world. 
Um, and uh, he welcomed that. He, he thought, oh, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, I hadn't considered that. Um, well, actually, in my field, we have a lot of problems with this. Uh, it was kind of like that. And um, there was never any of the defensiveness that I found with so many others in the field, um, particularly on the East Coast, who were worried about reputations or their graduate students or, you know, is Wen Fong going to be mad at me because I'm talking about a fake? that I think is at the Met. Um, I never had to uh, have off-the-record conversations. I mean, occasionally there'd be something that was personal that um, I had to keep to the side. But it wouldn't have been anything I'd want to use anyway. It wasn't relevant. So I, I found, um, again, this kind of generosity and accessibility and enthusiasm, boundless, almost boyish enthusiasm for what he was single-mindedly so passionate about. Um, but it, it, it came from a deeper well. Um, you know, Jim was just a mensch. He was a, a, a man of great character and integrity and um, concern for others. Um, um, and Patricia, my, my late wife, worked at the cheese board, and he loved the cheese board. He'd go up there for pizza and, and, uh, and bread and cheese, and they, they were quite friendly, even though they came from completely different worlds. Um, and uh, I liked that he was so respectful of her, and she enjoyed the same about him. Does that work for you? Yeah. You want more? You know, I have to sort of dig in this more. Um, I wouldn't ask you this if you weren't a writer. Go ahead. Oh, I'll take more. I can say more about him as a writer if you want. But go ahead. What's the question? Yeah. Well, just a description. You ready? Do I need to clap? No, we're rolling. Um, Chinese painting studies, um, unfortunately, uh, they have a branding problem and they have a language problem. Uh, the branding problem has to do with um, the exoticism of the names. Uh, it's not a tradition that's well known in the West. Unfortunately, the, much of the Western scholarship is very theoretical, very dense, very obscure, um, often unreadable. Jim, again, is the exception. Jim's writing is if you know nothing about China, if you know nothing about the history of Chinese painting, you can pick up that Skira Chinese painting book. You can pick up the Norton lectures and read them and find them not only lucid and acceptable, but really interesting and engaging. And it's because of what he's bringing into the mix, uh, the kind of metaphors, analogies that he makes, his ability to crosswalk between disciplines, literature, art, um, Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, he brings that all into play. He wasn't afraid of just talking common speech. That's in his writing. And it's a very American style of writing, but unfortunately not American academic style. It really grows from his wonderful appreciation of literature, um, his humor, his sense of humor. Uh, his appreciation uh, of the other great classical tradition, not the Western classical tradition, but the Chinese classical tradition. His respect for it, but not to the point of bowing down and worshiping it, um, the sacred cows. Um, he goes in there, as I said, with the mindset of a, of a good detective, a Columbo, and he goes to work. And he, he kind of talks to you that way in his writing. It comes through. Um, and he, he had a great appreciation for um, simple English prose, good English prose, tight sentences. You feel it in the syntax. Uh, the thinking is there. It's conversational. Uh, what you hear in those lectures, um, it, it's his voice. It's a very American voice in a certain way. Um, and he wrote with great lucidity. I had the, he asked me to actually help him edit a couple of his books. 
um, uh, one of his last books I did a sort of early edit of before it went to UC Berkeley Press. <clears throat> this is the book about um, uh, so-called beautiful women painting uh, erotic art, which is a subject in a field that no one else had touched in because it really is, well, this is not only a little improper, but it's, you know, it's not the great literati works. These are kind of paintings for middle class, the emergent middle class, uh, decorative, dismissed as decorative. Uh, and Jim went in there and found really interesting stories, really interesting. Uh, it became a platform, him to, platform for him to reflect about art patronage, art market, um, what it was like to be a painter in those times that these paintings were created, make a living as a painter. Um, and he writes about it in that down-to-earth way. Uh, and I think um, I learned a lot from working with him on editing some of his writing. Um, and I, I think he appreciated the fact that I, I wrote like a journalist. I wrote as a journalist, so I have to and I'm writing about a field that's kind of esoteric and a little prissy and tony. And I'm trying to translate that so that people understand when I'm talking about forgery, some rather difficult conceptual pieces of that. Namely, that Chinese have different attitudes about forgery than in the West. So I admire Jim as a writer, very lucid, very clear, the exception in his field. Uh, there's not a more lucid writer in the field of Chinese painting than James Cahill. God, you snuck in James Cahill. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> that was great. That was great. It was a perfect way to bring him in. The, you know, the, the formal way. That was wonderful. Um, well, now I'm just going to open it up and okay. ask you. Go ahead. If, if there is anything else about him that wasn't on our list or wasn't... Uh, I didn't. Did you? Yeah. yeah, I didn't. That was an exhibition of the book that I was I was referring to. You know, I made some notes. Let me just see if there's anything in there that I'm a, I'm a little bit of a blur here.
left. You know, he was, Jim was a man of the left. He was, um, I think, a, a kind of uh, anarchist individualist type and um, in, a, in a sort of wobbly, as in the wobblies, um, um, sense of things. Um, he certainly, uh, in the 60s and uh, later, he, you know, he, he sympathized with what was going on on the left side of the spectrum and was very discouraged post-Reagan into the Bush era with the landscape of American politics. Uh, and really, the, the, uh, I remember talking to him about Obama and hearing him say how utterly racist he felt the Republicans were being about Obama and how discouraging it was. You know, this was a momentous change in our society to elect an African-American president and what promise that brought. And he felt that the Republicans had ambushed, um, the Republican Congress had ambushed. Um, Obama. And um, there was a great deal towards the end of his life of discouragement about what was going on with the wars in Iraq and, and uh, the posture of um, the American military and the American military industrial complex, that that was overpowering and, and um, becoming so burdensome to the society and setting us back. So I know that sensibility was there. I mean, from the minute I knew him, that, that, that part of his character was, was obvious. Um, I don't know where else to go with this without sounding like I'm pontificating. So I, you know, it's going to be more me than about Jim. <laughs> Maybe you've gotten this from other people. Ask any, you know, continue, because I can't, I'm just fishing right now. I don't... Um, I mean, I could certainly talk more about Zhang Da Chen, um, but I don't think it's totally relevant to what you're doing. Um, no. I, um, how uh, about uh, the last time you saw Jim? Thank you for asking that. Um, a few months before he died, he was bedridden. Um, my wife, who was also at that point dying of cancer, um, and really loved Jim, made a Mexican meal for him. So I brought it over because uh, could, Patricia couldn't really travel at that point in time. And, uh, you know, Jim was bedridden. He was watching movies. He was still working on this wonderful project of lectures. Um, and his spirits, uh, much like my late wife, I mean, there were both people who were just very tough-minded you know, they, they knew their time had come. They weren't afraid of dying. They just didn't want to be in pain. He wasn't at that time in a lot of pain, but the fact that he wasn't mobile, couldn't really get out of bed, um, was hard for him, I think. Um, but mostly it was his mental faculties. They were functioning. I mean, he could converse. Um, he could converse well. We talked about matters relating to Zhang Da Chen, to his lectures. He was still, it was as if whatever, whatever despondency or, or sadness he had about leaving uh, and dying would instantly change. And this, again, he would manifest this boundless enthusiasm and love of his subject. And the Zhang Da Chen forgery, the riverbank controversy, he kept asking me, you know, please write something more about this. I'm get, he gave me a lot of new material, which I will at some point put out there, um, about his new discoveries about the riverbank, because he felt that no one in the field was listening to him about this painting. That his, not only were his initial misgivings, his initial indictment of the painting, the multi-count indictment that he published at the Met Symposium. Not only had no one really responded to the issues he raised, but subsequently, in correspondence with other scholars, his new discoveries, no one was paying attention to it. And, um, you know, the, the, that's a sad thing, because he, he was making contributions to the field up until the day he died. Um, and that series of lectures 
there's nothing like it in the field out there right now. I mean, if you really want an in-depth course in the whole history of Chinese painting, you've got it in these lectures. They're extraordinary. And there's a, there's a uh, I don't know if it's a, f uh, a separate lecture, but I know there's one about the riverbank. So it's all there. The documentation is all there. You can go online and see it. And uh, I hope people will do that. It's entertaining. It's fun. Um, it's a great exercise in sleuthing. And I really admire the fact that Jim was true to himself up until the day he died. I remember there was also a party at his house that Sarah arranged uh, where we gathered in the kitchen at Josephine Street. He and a bunch of students, colleagues, and friends. There must have been 30, 40 people in there. And um, everybody made kind of, including myself, impromptu sort of homage to him. Uh, and I spoke about my gratitude to uh, his being so accessible and accepting someone like myself outside the field to come in and have a dialogue with him that continued over 30 years. That I admired the integrity of his speaking out in a field where there were a lot of closed mouths and closed doors and skeletons in the closet. Jim was unusual in that regard. And after that party, several of his colleagues from the museum came up to me and he said, I'm they said, I'm really glad you said that because it's true about him. You know, he, he really was uh, unflappable and undaunted. He, he was not afraid of anybody in the field, and he wasn't. Um, uh, he, he was afraid of, if he was afraid of anything, it wasn't dying. It wasn't um, authority figures. It wasn't experts. It wasn't people who disagreed with him. If he was afraid of anything, it was untruth and ignorance and injustice that he knew the power of, and there's a lot of it out there. And Jim was a man who stood up to it. That's why I think he, you know, if you think about great scholars that, and great scholarship that um, this country's contributed, Jim is up there because he's one of those people. He had that in the core of his work, the core of his being, um, the core of his teaching, um, and the breadth and depth he brought uh, to his passion for Chinese painting. I'm going to miss him. I miss him every day. He was an um, important person in my life, uh, a real friend and teacher. Always with humor. Even in his death, there was this um, uh, an attitude I saw in my wife as well, you know. Um, he owned it. You know, he didn't run away from it. Um, bring it on. It's part of, the, part of the deal here in this world of dust and shadows. Um, and um, Jim was not afraid. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to have to bring me a handkerchief. <laughs> I was trying to, I, I, made, I made somebody else cry this morning. I was crying for two. <laughs> Five people crying on this film. Well, I understand all. I don't think it's you who made him cry, baby. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to make people cry. If they want to cry, they cry. <laughs> That's all right. I understand. Okay. I just happen to be sitting in front of you. All right. He's not going to tell me the question. He's going to sandbag me. Watch it. Yeah, well, that's right. No, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the TV news soundbite summary that is really concise of 
Jim cared about him, who he was, why he's important. Jim Cahill is an American master in the domain of being a scholar. Um, Jim was an, an extraordinarily brave, uh, honest a man of deep integrity in a field that's been very troubled um, and very esoteric um, and yet an extremely important academic and artistic um, area, Chinese painting. This is one of the two great world artistic traditions. It's the other classical tradition. Um, Jim breathed it, lived it, um, and um, made it accessible, made it accessible, not only to several generations of students, but to the general public. Um, and that was because of his extraordinarily um, broad uh, and deep intellectual understanding of that tradition, but what he brought to the discipline of it. Um, uh, a, an Irish renegade and American, very American um, sense of, of um, individualism, history, the complexity, um, the transmission of Chinese painting to the West. I don't think it's, it's possible to think about it without mentioning Jim Cahill. He's, an, he's a paramount actor and scholar in that in that theater. And as a writer, an extraordinarily lucid, um, and again, uh, the prose is accessible. It's not the kind of academic, theoretical, jargony art history that the field is plagued with and makes it so inaccessible. Jim played a key role in making it accessible to many uh, outside the field, and it was the breadth of his knowledge of other traditions, other artistic traditions, not only Western art, but Japanese art, uh, his interest in literature, his interest in detective novels, he was a great sleuth, um, and Jim played an extremely important role in tackling the most difficult question in the field, which is the problem of forgery. Um, which is a complex, uh, long history in Chinese art. Very different values attached to it, very different roles it played. Jim was able to both focus on the picture and the work of art, but also see the deep, broad context of what it meant to live and work as an artist in China. Um, and that's what's unique about him as a scholar was that breadth. He would look at things that other scholars in the field couldn't care less about because they're very siloed, very, um, it's a very arcane field. Um, he was a man of enormous generosity to his students, um, to his friends, um, and that gift informed how he wrote, how he conducted himself in the field, um, he was never involved in the kind of petty character assassinations. Uh, somebody once said to me uh, that art history is not uh, a humanistic uh, discipline, it's a vehicle for revenge. Uh, <laughs> and my experience in the art market and covering sort of Chinese painting um, scandals and controversies gives some proof to that dictum. Uh, it's a little exaggerated, but um, there's serious scholarship that goes on in the field. But it's been plagued by these kinds of controversies because it's a new field in the West. Jim was one of the great pioneers uh, of it and a wonderful communicator. Um, he brought to it a, an almost theatrical sense um, because Jim was interested in, in opera. He wrote librettos. He liked Gilbert and Sullivan. He, he was a great entertainer as a lecturer. And um, his legacy, uh, I think uh, an important piece of it beyond the volumes of books and studies he produced, are these wonderful lectures that um, I, it's the East Asian Studies Library at, at UC Berkeley is, has preserved and put online 
um, anybody can get access to them. And uh, that's a brilliant contribution. You get a sense of the man, and you get a sense of his integrity. You get a sense of um, his wonderful writing and speaking skills. Um, a great American communicator of cultures far from our shores. Um, he had a Pacific imagination that he brought to the, to the table as a scholar. Uh, a different orientation from East Coast European oriented scholarship. Um, Jim was a, a Berkeley, California man. Um, when he was offered positions at Harvard, he said, no, uh, I'm, I belong out here. This is my landscape. This is my worldview. Um, and that's in his character, too. Uh, he had in his blood uh, the blood of an Irish rebel. Um, and could drink his scotch and his bourbon well. Um, and he, he was a great raconteur. Um, and um, I am honored to have been his friend and his colleague for a long time, for 30 years. Enough? Yeah, yeah plenty. But um, uh, I had one thought, which was, I had two thoughts, which was the problem. You know, I, I can laboring back and forth. Um, Oh, that's right. Uh, we'll take them both. Does he, <laughs> does he really deserve all this attention is kind of the question. Uh, the attention, you know. I think Jim, are you rolling? Yeah. Jim deserves the attention that, uh, and uh, of his stature and, and his reputation. I think from, you know, my standpoint as a journalist who's observed this field uh, for a few decades now, because of the integrity he brought to his work. He was not afraid to take on the establishment. He was not afraid to take on the Chinese art market, the Chinese art history establishment. He would not uh, kowtow to the cultural authorities, either in the mainland, in Taiwan, or in Europe and the United States. He was willing to discuss the problems of forgery, he was willing to call a painting in the British Museum attributed to Chu Ron, a Song Dynasty painter, uh, and say, no, this is a 20th century forgery by Zhang Da Chen. Um, and um, an opinion which was very controversial when he first voiced it, uh, and slowly has come to be accepted. It's now part of the officially accepted canon of Zhang Da Chen forgeries. Um, other paintings, similarly, um, he did this at a time when nobody spoke of these things openly. I think he deserves the attention further by being a brilliant communicator of a very esoteric field, making it accessible to people like myself, who knew very little, little about it, or knew about it from a, a rather, you know, as a, as a reporter, as a journalist. Um, he deserves the attention because not only did he write voluminous histories of epics of Chinese painting, his scholarship focused on individual artists, on the practice of being a painter in China, on the art market, the breadth of this and what he brought to it as a scholar in the field of Chinese painting, absolutely unprecedented. One other sort of issue I was thinking about was his um, language ability, his ability to speak the language. How does that? Is it, I mean, is it Chinese language or English uh, language? Oh, uh, no, well, not English, I think you mean. Prim no, primarily his ability to speak Japanese, Chinese. How, what, yeah, I, I, I think there'd be like some people who would question his, his Chinese his language <laughs> capabilities, okay. not so much in Japanese, but I'll talk about, I mean, he had the gift of gab, I can say that if you want. Um, uh, he was Irish and he had the gift of gab. Uh, okay, you want that? Yeah, don't, don't look at me. You, you, have you know, Jim as a communicator, this is again his, his Irish, um, he had the, his Irish nature and Irish soul, he had the gift of gab. And he was a, a great performer. Uh, you know, he loved the sort of 
bathos and humor of Gilbert and Sullivan operettas as well as high opera classical music. And he had a performer's uh, ability, a great performer's actor's ability as a lecturer. Um, he was speaking to you and, and speaking to, appealing to um, your depth, your, your curiosity, um, your interest in, in worlds beyond your own, um, and never spoke down to you, never was patronizing or condescending. Uh, I really admired that quality. Um, you know, you go to these symposia on Chinese painting studies, and they're really kind of, uh, they can be quite dreadful and monotonous, and people are talking about, you know, styles of calligraphy script or very esoteric, pedantic stuff, and talking about it with these great theoretical constructs. Jim was always putting the painting out there first. Look at this painting, what do you see? You know, let's, let's really examine what's in here. He brought you into it, he brought you into the field. Um, and uh, he was extraordinarily gifted as a speaker and as a lecturer, but also just as a conversationalist. I mean, I have taped dozens of hours of interviews with him and they're entertaining, I mean, just to listen to him. Uh, and all of his students would say this about him, um, that I, the students that I knew. Uh, he had that kind of charisma. You know, this was the lecturer you wanted to go to hear uh, in, this, in this field. I think that's great, and it's almost five, so I think we should. All right. You're done this up, but I, I, I reserve the right to come back to you. Oh, please. You are welcome. Careful, you can't go oh,